to hear from our own Patrick Kirch um, about the, the work that he's done on the, um, the general area of Polynesian social and political uh, organization using his environmental approaches, which those of you who are graduate students have been exposed to multiple times in classes, I know. Um, and I guess the only other thing I would add to what's written here, which is that Pat is the Chancellor's Professor Emeritus in the department, is that he has just come back from receiving an honorary degree um, in Tahiti, which is a career goal for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> on wines and they had this advertising slogan I will sell no wine before it's time because this was cheap jug wine you know so carafe wine but Kent Flannery uh, quoted this in his Hilo Nakit's monograph which took him I don't know 20 some years to write and so I had to borrow this too because what I'm going to talk to you about today is the, the very first project I did when I came to Berkeley not my first project in my career but First one at Berkeley, 1989, 1991, I went to Mangaya Island. And I've just now completed the monograph. Uh, it'll be published next year, I hope. So some things take time. I will publish no site before it's time. Um, <clears throat> so Rosemary alluded to, I have been working for many years under this general kind of approach of using islands as model systems for understanding human natural interactions. Polynesian islands are great places to do this because they're you have all of these relatively isolated, circumscribed islands. Uh, they were all <clears throat> settled, that is within Polynesia, by groups who were very closely related to ancestral culture. So we can kind of, we have a controlled comparison case where we can look at how the same culture, ancestral culture, adapted to, modified change, and, and had to itself respond to uh, various changes set up on these previously uninhabited islands. <clears throat> I got a lot of slides, so I'm gonna go fast. That's where Mangai is located in the uh, southern, it's the southernmost of the Cook Islands group in central eastern Polynesia. Um, you know, some of these were scanned from very old slides, so you have to, <laughs> this is like 30 years old, folks. No digital photos in this era. Uh, here we are flying in, you could get to Mangai, and I think it's still the same today, once a week on a small plane, about a 10 seater uh, little twin engine airplane. So here we are flying into Mangai. Uh, the airstrip is somewhere <laughs> down that point, you can't even hardly see it. And the thing to note about Mangaya here uh, in this kind of lousy slide is that it's a pretty low island. Um, it is volcanic in the central core, as you'll see in a second, but it, it doesn't have a lot of elevation. I think 160 meters is its highest uh, point. <clears throat> There's the uh, topographic map. Um, it looks a little pixelated to me, but anyway. What you can see on the map here is that we have the central volcanic cone, which is dissected uh, with radial stream valleys, like six stream valleys that descend from the central, uh, can't really call it a peak, but highest point, 160 meters. <clears throat> and then what's, what's showing here in the sort of solid green is a ring of uplifted reef limestone, which is called Makatea in Polynesia, means white rock, because when you cut into it, it's very white. Um, and so that provides a, a kind of unique um, geological situation, volcanic interior, old volcanic interior, I should say 20 million years old, which is unusually old in the Pacific. Most Pacific islands are only about 5 million years old, and then they subside. What's happened with this one is it came back up again, uh, which is too long to explain how geologically, but it was pushed back up, um, and the reefs that were surrounding it came up with it, creating this rampart sort of around it. <clears throat> um, when we Worked there over the two field seasons. Concentrated, there, there were six districts, as you can see here, traditional districts. We concentrated on Kea and especially Waitate. Uh, so that's where most of the sites that we've located are uh, shown here, various kinds of sites. Essentially, the settlement pattern uh, was focused on the interior, because that's where you have streams and water and you could irrigate. Um, the, the coastal margin was until the missionaries came, largely unoccupied. Uh, it was utilized for fishing but people were really inhabiting the interior because we have these swamps, you can see at the base of each valley where the drainages would come down and pond against the Makatea and those were converted into intensive taro irrigation swamps. So the people were living in dispersed habitations around these taro irrigation systems, their temples there and so on. 
And the site I'm going to talk about mostly today, Man 44, or the Tangata Tau rock shelter, is located there in Kea. So if we <coughs> focus in with an aerial photograph of that area um, of, of Waitate, <coughs> So here's the location of the rock shelter. This is the Makatea, the upraised limestone. So it has an inner escarpment, which has a basically solution eroded back over several hundred thousand years. It's up to 80 meters high cliff. And then you've got this interior, very old eroded volcanic terrain, mostly in degraded fernlands. And in between the lower slopes and especially the uh, valley bottoms, this is all in irrigated pond fields, and I think you can sort of make out some of the fields there, the rectangular fields. And then uh, where this drainage hits the Makatea, there's a little, it's really a pond, they call it a lake, Tiriara. I'll get to that at the end of the talk, if we have time. We did fallen coring there to get a vegetation change. And what happens, the water actually goes through into underground solution, uh, sort of caverns, and eventually comes out under sea along the coast. Well, here's the rock shelter, lousy photo, but um, we found this on, I think it was the second day of field work. Uh, it was one of these chance things. I was riding along in this old pickup truck, these dirt roads, trying to head down to that lake, Tiriara, to set things up for our pollen analysts who are going to fly in the next week. And I saw this big sort of overhang off, not very far away, and I said, stop, stop, I want to go check that out. And here was this beautiful big rock shelter. And it turns out it was the best site we ever found on the island. We found it the second day. So, you know, luck, sometimes luck plays a role. Um, <clears throat> so we did a test trench in 1989, which was from about here back, this trench here, and the site proved to be beautifully stratified and full of wonderful faunal remains, and you'll see that in a minute. So we targeted, to, I got an NSF grant, I think the first work was, uh, was a Werner Gren uh, grant actually. No, sorry, it was the National Geographic Committee on Research, and then we Got an NSF grant, went back in 91 and opened up the rest of the units you see there, about 29, I think it was, square meters in total that we uh, excavated. And of course, it was an interdisciplinary project designed that way. Um, the, here are the <coughs> members of the, the field team in 91. So my main collaborator, David Stedman, uh, some of you remember, he spent a semester here at Berkeley, zooarchaeologist, pa paleon, avian paleontologist, really trained in geosciences, not archaeology. Uh, but Virginia Butler was our zooarchaeologist on site, um, trained by Don Grayson at Washington, expert in fish bones. John Hather, archaeobotanist, also worked with us on site on plant remains. Joanna Allison, who did the palynology, and my two first graduate students here, well, not my two first, but the first who came here to Berkeley explicitly, Pia Anderson and Julie Endicott, were also on the team. Just some shots of the excavation. <coughs> Uh, it's a beautiful big shelter, you know, you can walk around the whole thing, it's dry. Behind the drip line, about 200 and some square meters that are nice and dry. And it's very beautifully stratified, as you can see, between about a meter, meter 20, depending on where you are on the side of finely bedded uh, sediments, as you often get in rock shelters. And here's uh, one of the main stratigraphic sections through that long trench, and you can see, you know, how <coughs> Nicely stratified, but also complex, uh, this thing was with, in many cases, you know, there are various hearth and ash beds and then, you know, pits. And it was a challenge to excavate, obviously. Um, when you first, we were first going down in 89, the first test bit, because you're going blind, you don't know what you're going to encounter. But once we did that, we then expanded out very carefully, trying to follow uh, individual beds and so on. And we used the Harris matrix. Um, Recording system, this is just another shot, there's another section going kind of orthogonal to the last one you saw there, it's the face that you see here is uh, drawn there. And <clears throat> because of various intercutting pits, so on at one phase, only part of the site had the earliest deposits exposed, that's the part you see here, that's uh, zones two, <coughs> two three, four. Uh, <clears throat> we numbered, just in case you're curious, we numbered the, the beds Whoops, I went up one too far. Here we go. So you'll see there are beds numbered there. Uh, they're going down, numbered them from top to bottom. But then we um, synthesized that into a set of zones, right? We're combining, in some cases, very fine beds together in one stratigraphic zone. And we ended up with 19 stratigraphic zones. And I think that's the next. So all of those were 
put together into a matrix, stratigraphic matrix. Uh, the zones are there in heavy boxes. And then a series of features, there are about 55, I think, total features, mostly combustion features, hearths or earth ovens. And I've only shown on this version those that actually had some artifact or their content, because we do have a matrix of it all, but it's much more complicated to try to read. So just keep in mind, um, we're going, uh, uh, most of the charts and everything I'll show you from now on, use the zone system, and we're going from bottom up through this, okay? And in the case of something like 19, this is because it was a huge boulder that uh, separated one end of that long trench and you just couldn't correlate directly. So we have to have 19 kind of floats out there in space. But um, <clears throat> general, the, the stratigraphy is going with numbers from one up through time. And one A is all pre-human. And one B is a sort of the first people are mucking about on the site surface. And then two on is, is real occupation deposits. Um, as I've been down in the sediment lab all morning and yesterday, this is reminiscent here. Well, the, that dirt lab downstairs, <clears throat> piece of historical interest. I actually set that up with Marshall Weisler back in 89. Kent will remember. And I think some of the very first work that was done there was Jim Allen, your student, mm -hmm. who I hired as my GSI. So we did all of this. And I'm not going to talk about what all this means, but we analyzed a whole series of sediment samples up and down the column. Um, <clears throat> you can see there's a, there's a lot of variation there. I better just show you that for the fun of it. So I'll be in the monograph. Come on. Doesn't want to go forward. Go. It's trying to understand the data and it's sitting there. <laughs> Come on. Let me try it this way. Advance. You sucker. There. OK. <laughs> Uh, and, and point counting of individual micro artifacts. And you can see, again, if you look at this, most of the, the stuff is fine rock or lithic fragments, a um, lot, of, lot of charcoal, a lot of bone. Um, anyway, we don't have to talk about that in detail. What is interesting is the radiocarbon chronology. Now, because it's an old project, started almost 30 years ago, uh, I have spanned kind of the progress of radiocarbon dating in this. And it's interesting to you know, write this up now. We ran, say here, uh, how many, 20, 24 radiocarbon dates initially after the first two field seasons. Now, this was before AMS. AMS was not yet developed, uh, before any Bayesian calibration or whatever, right? And this is what an OxCal plot of those dates looks like, pretty much in stratigraphic. I put them in stratigraphic order. Um, you can see there's a few outliers. Most of them fall in sequence, but there are outliers that for one reason or another probably in this case, older material that has gotten reincorporated up higher in the section. I don't know what's going on with this one, but of course, there's a huge standard deviation. Um, <clears throat> in 93, AMS dating was really just beginning. And the Lawrence Livermore lab here set up its AMS facility. And we had an opportunity, Berkeley faculty, to request uh, dates through Lawrence Livermore at, I think, almost, I think it was free, actually, back then. So I took advantage of that. And the big question we had initially was the age of the first occupation of the site. And in fact, that layer 1A underneath, which had a lot of extinct bird bone. So we ran a series of AMS dates. So these are the first AMS dates. And these were all on extinct bird bone. And these were all on rat. Jillian will like that. Ratus exulens, the little Pacific rat, which is a, came with Polynesians. Okay. And so we thought that's a good way to try to tie down when did people get on the island. And you can see they formed a real nice, tight little uh, set there at around, uh, I, say, I think it's around between 1100, 1200 AD. But you can see that the extinct bird bones go back to more than 6,000 years ago. So 1A is really a palimpsest, natural deposition, birds who are roosting on these cliffs, gradually dying and falling into this thing. When I Decided I really had to finish writing this thing up a couple of years ago, get back into it. I, I said, well, we've got to get some new dates from the main occupation layers. So over the last three years, I've now gotten another 25 AMS dates, all on identified short-lived charcoal. Uh, fortunately, John Hather had identified a lot of material from the site. I got it back from UCL. And so I selected that. And you can see how the chronology has just tightened up, just because we're doing short-lived identified material and AMS dating. Again, there's, a, you know, there's an outlier, too, you have to uh, take out of it. This one's obviously an outlier, so is that, because these are in supposed stratigraphic sequence. But it, it's a really nice set now, 
and <clears throat> you know, old dogs trying to learn new tricks. <laughs> I've been spending a lot of time on the BCAL and the OxCal sites doing Bayesian calibration. So this is the using BCAL. I'm familiar with that, but uh, Caitlin Buck's uh, system. So there's the model. Um, because it's well stratified, we can pretty much put everything I into a nice column, except one of those zones, nine. We're not certain exactly where it fits. Anyway, uh, and that's what BCAL gives you for the alpha or beginning uh, dates for each of the zone, main zones going up. Very nice, tight calibrations. Of course, the early polymcest has a big, big range. That's the pre-human. And if you prefer OxCal, here's the OxCal uh, calibration. It'll all fit nicely on one slide, so it goes one, two, three, early to late. It's running, running that way. Uh, but all of those <coughs> AMS dates, uh, you know, can now be fitted quite nicely into a Bayesian calibration. So the site, the actual occupation by humans, by Polynesians, begins at around early 1200s AD, Cal AD, and runs right up to European contact. The uppermost zone, 17, actually has some historic bottles and a bit of, you know, ceramic fragments and things like this. It wasn't an intensive historic occupation, but we run into the contact period. Missionar missionaries arrived there in 18. 32. So that so we're basically from the early 1200s to uh, the early 19th century. Now I want to run through some of the data. This is a data-rich talk. The faunal sequence, <clears throat> and one of the reasons we we went to Mangaya and went to this site, or once we found the site, focused on it, was my collaborator David Stedman works on birds in the Pacific and on these remote islands. Those of you not familiar with Polynesia. We didn't have vertebrates other than bird, land vertebrates other than birds, pretty much, because uh, nobody else, you know, the tigers and the pussycats and the bears and the wombats couldn't get out there, right? Uh, they couldn't swim. So, <clears throat> but birds could fly in. And so what you get on these Pacific Islands is both seabirds, nesting populations, but also various land birds whose ancestors flew out and then, which often evolved flightlessness, among other things, but some remain flighted. But so you get a bunch of endemic species evolving on these islands. And Stedman had been there briefly to the island before me, and certain cave, uh, cave deposits in the Makatea had found bo bones of extinct rails and so on. So we were very excited with this site because we had a really nice faunal sequence, uh, including a lot of bird material. So this is showing you uh, basically the, the flighted creatures, <coughs> seabirds, land birds, and there is a fruit bat, so there's a mammal involved here, uh, a little fruit bat, which is also very tasty. Uh, and what you can see, I mean, overall, generally, as time is going this way in this thing, uh, is, of course, a big decline in the land birds in particular. So they're hitting them hard, right? And they are declining. Probably a combination of taking them for food, feathers, and habitat disturbance and destruction. They're clearing land for gardens, and so they're reducing the habitat. Uh, the Pacific rat may have also had an impact um, predating on some of the young or the eggs. Uh, so a combination of things. The bat story is quite interesting. Here's the bat. Um, <clears throat> reasonable numbers here. And by about zone five, it's gone. And this really interests us because the bat is there today, right? This bat's flying around the island today. They still shoot it with shotguns now and, and eat it. But the archaeological record says it's gone by zone five. Aha. Although there's no historic record of this, it's pretty clear it was reintroduced in the 19th century. We know they did this in Tahiti. They brought it from Tonga. And the clue to that is the Manga, uh, Mangayan name, right? Because there's a name for the bat all through Polynesia or exists. It's called Pekka. And instead of having Pekka or Pea here, they call it Moa Kiri Kiri, chicken with fur. <laughs> so if they had retained it, you see, from ancestors, they should have the Polynesian name, the ancestral name. Instead, it's pretty clearly it was reintroduced, although there was no record written down of that. And when this thing comes back in, that, you know, they don't have, they lost the memory of it. What's that? Oh. Furry chicken, good to eat. <laughs> so there you have it. Um, I have to go into detail. Just uh, summarize when we take the whole land bird record and then, then the seabird record, I mean, it's a story of real loss in the avifauna. Uh, as you can see here, the, the resident land birds declining from 18 to 5 species present on the island today, and the seabirds 13 uh, to 8. So big reductions in the resident avifauna. Now, if we look at the introduced fauna, because Polynesians brought with them pigs, dogs, chickens, as well as the rat problem. Well, it's a debate whether the rat came purposely or not. Um, but you can see here, 
the pig, for example, um, pretty substantial numbers early, then some declines, then it sort of rebuilds. I'll get back to that later. And if we include the medium mammal, which is probably almost all pig, so we've separated out because small long bone fragments of dog or pig are almost impossible to, to separate out, I mean, unless we did DNA analysis on it. But given that pig dominates, we feel that most of the medium mammal is pig. So combine those, you'll see that there was a lot of pig husbandry going on early, but then declines, and then it increases again. But the curious thing is pig was absent at the time of missionary contact. So they had eliminated the pig. Um, probably, I would argue, because it was, they were competing with pigs for food, basically, because on small islands, we had agriculture, you can't let pigs roam free, you've got to feed them. Otherwise, they devastate your garden. So at some point, if your population numbers are up high and you're you know, hard pressed for calories, you have to make a decision. You're going to give those tubers to the pig where you lose 90% of the energy. You get nice pig meat to feast, but you're losing 90% of your caloric value. So uh, anyway, what we know definitely, the pigs were gone, and the missionaries, a very interesting missionary accounts, missionaries arrived, and they found there were no pigs once they'd converted the people, and they brought a breeding pair of pigs. And the Mangayans, this is well described, took those two pigs, decorated them with bark cloth, took them to the temple of Marai, and said, you know, go to it, pigs, do your pig. <laughs> pig thing and very soon there were big pig herds and you know they were raising tons of pigs so uh, and the rat this is the rat frequency these are these graphs were all corrected to what I call concentration indices so they're all NIST by cubic meter okay so because the zones vary in thickness and so on and so the rat is doing an interesting pattern as well um, high density early and then it drops way down and then it goes back <clears throat> up to a high density I'm not quite sure what the explanation for this one is uh, but just a further note on the rats, this is a quote from the missionary Williams, 1837. Um, you can read it for yourselves. I hate it when people read their PowerPoints. Um, so as you can see, when the missionaries came, the, the pigs were gone, and the dogs were gone too, by the way. And so the principal uh, flesh food for the Mangayans was these little rats. And, and they loved them. They, said, any, they would compare any new thing to a rat. It's sweet as a rat. It's a, <laughs> Uh, and then they had, you see, on, on Sabbath, the Sunday, well, they had to catch, on Saturday, they had to catch the rats because they couldn't do work on Sunday after they were made good Calvinists. Uh, but they wanted their rats to eat with their vegetables. So, uh, so we know the rat became a very important food item. So this gives you some hints, I think, of the level of protein kind of deprivation or stress of the late period pre-missionization. So let's turn to the marine uh, realm in that regard because Typically on these Polynesian islands, the marine realm is where you get a lot of your protein, fishing, shell fishing. But the problem with Mangaya is, due to this unique geology, the reef is very, very tiny. You have no barrier reef, you have no lagoon, you have only a very narrow fringing reef. In many cases, it's only 50 meters wide. You know, it's like, you know, the width of this building or something. Uh, so your area of potential resource exploitation in terms of, of reef you know, fishing and shellfish gathering is extremely limited on Mangaya, about the most limited I've ever seen. You, of course, can go offshore and do some pelagic fishing, but the open ocean is a desert compared to reefs. Um, you know, your reefs are where your high productivity is. That's where your biomass is. Um, <clears throat> and so if you have very small reefs, you're going to have real limited possibility for marine exploitation. There we go. Um, the final record is very rich in, in fish bones. Virginia Butler, as I mentioned, was our zooarchaeologist, and she's written this up very nicely. She made her own reference collection on the island with, with local fishermen helping her, over 100 species, and she used that to identify these plates, which will be in the monograph we're showing you, you know, a reference and then an archaeological uh, for a comparison. And this, this guy, Iliotris, uh, I'll mention that in a minute, it's very interesting because this is a freshwater, a sort of goby-like little fish that lives in those lakes and those pond fields. And turns out, let's see if I can get the next slide. It's going very slowly. Come on. Come on, come on. I've never used this computer. It's a new computer before to do a presentation. Anyway, um, you should see five families of fish dominate the faunal assemblage here. And <clears throat> 
and the most, uh, just a percent in ISP, and the most dominant is that little freshwater guy, the Eleotridae. And there's an ethnographic description of, they use nets, little seine nets, to, to haul, seine haul these lakes or ponds uh, periodically. Apparently they would not do it all the time, they would like put a taboo on the resource for all that it gather, and then they would sweep this thing. And it looks like that's, you know, we're getting a reflection of that strategy here in this site. Um, and the other one that is freshwater is the Anguillidae. These are freshwater eels. So they're taking both of those. Everything else is marine. Um, <coughs> and this is freshwater versus marine compared through the sequence. You can see marine dominates and the two kind of go in parallel. But freshwater is not inconsequential. But at the very late period, what happens is the freshwater actually exceeds the marine. So, and I think this had to do with the maximum development of the pond field irrigation system. And they really did, so this was a kind of sustainable resource that they actually developed. Whereas the marine resources, they were just hammering, as you'll see in a second. Um, <clears throat> and so these are, again, changes in, those are the two freshwater ones. Uh, you, can, you see the big bumps up in the freshwater, especially the uh, little gobid, and then some of the marine changes. Now in the invertebrates, especially the mollusks, uh, again, remember this reef is very limited. These are some of the main uh, species, gastropods and, and bivalves that we had on the site. And here I've got the <coughs> rank ordered uh, by concentration. You can see again, a limited number, you know, about six, six, seven of those taxa really dominate the assemblage, even though they're taking basically anything they get their hands on. Uh, it's interesting that early on, remember that's when the pig and dog exploitation, the birds are going very high the mollusks are in relatively low concentration. I just think they weren't really bothering when they had these other protein resources. But once they uh, had hammered those and the pigs were declining for reasons I will suggest, then they went to the mollusks big, big time, as you can see. And um, I don't have time to get into all the details of it. It's interesting when you look at <coughs> these various species and the changes. I'll just mention, for example, uh, Tectonarius <coughs> grandinatus, this guy here, See, it's primarily only early and then gone. Well, this is one that lives right around the, on the rocky shore of the beach. Very easy to gather. You just go right out there. Its habitat is right there, and you, you would hit it. So it's, it's hit early, and then it's gone. Uh, in contrast, uh, Modiolus, which I think I have, where is it? Yeah, this one here is X, which increases a lot in the late period. That is something that lives on algae. And the reef today, when you, these reefs are very fragile, the coral. So you just go out and walking on them to gather shellfish and stuff, you start crushing coral. So you imagine centuries of people walking, very narrow little reef. What happens is you get a dead coral platform instead of living coral, and that's an algae habitat. So I think that some of this shift has to do also with the changing ecology of the reef, but which itself was a, you know, a reflection of human activities. So you get these algae beds and you get these mussels. It's a little muscle, the modi modiolus. And the one, uh, I, I wish we could measure size changes in many of these taxa, but they were also smashing these things up. They were trying to get every last scrap of meat out of them, as far as I can tell. So they were hammering the shellfish. There's very little whole shellfish you can measure. However, this guy, which is very highly prized, it's the biggest mollusk out there, uh, has the biggest meat package in it, the turbocytosis, and it has a operculum, a trap door here, which is extremely resistant. And those are almost always found whole in the site. And the size of that operculum is allometrically related to the overall size of the shell very nicely. So we could measure that. So there's one uh, species, we could measure it. And there you see, again, from early to late, um, the data on sizes of these operculi. And you see what's happening is early on, they're only going for the big ones, right? The very first layers. And then they still have some big ones, but they're taking them down to the small size. And the big ones get fewer and fewer. And then at the end of the sequence, they're only taking small ones, right? So this is a classic case of what's called resource depression. And there's some other interesting mollusks that are not uh, marine. This guy is a arboreal tree snail, the one on the left there, with a partial, they're about this big. And in Tahiti, they like to make lays, necklaces out of these. They're beautiful white things. And apparently, it's a species native to Tahiti. Um, which looks like they transported it into Mangaio. This has been argued for some of the other islands by some malacologists. And this middle one 
is a freshwater snail, uh, which seems to have again come in with Polynesians on probably their irrigated taro. Uh, so that's another transported sort of invasive species if you want. And the other one is a naturally uh, occurring. Archaeobotany, quickly. So the site was not only rich in fauna, but in plant remains. John Hather, who was an archaeobotanist at UCL in London, uh, worked all this up. This is the list of from macro botanical remains of crop plants that we had evidenced. Um, probably not everything they were cultivating, but a nice representation and from early on in the, the deep layers of the site. So we know they were bringing in a whole lot of food plants and, and various other non-food plants as well. Um, <clears throat> I'll show you what some of these look like. Uh, John, who had both macro and he did a lot of SEM work identifying so coconut, for example, um, that both the shell, we have husk and uh, this is sugarcane, the stalk of, of sugarcane. It's a Polynesian domestic, well, oceanic domesticate. Um, pandanus, the screw pine plant. You can actually eat, it's, it's not a lot there, but you can suck the bottom off this thing. Um, but they also use the leaves for making mats and so on. Hernandi is just a locally occurring, uh, it's not edible, but there are, for some reason, a lot of those seeds in the site. Uh, the cordyline, the Polynesian tea, not the tea you drink, uh, it has a big edible root that when you cook it turns uh, sugary, that's there. And bamboo, which again, not an edible plant, but very important for them for fishing poles and also used in house construction, that sort of thing. So um, <clears throat> bamboo is introduced as well. John Hather identified, we made a wood collection on the island and he carbonized it. So we had a charcoal reference collection, some of the first work of this kind done in the Pacific and he analyzed charcoal from four different units um, stratigraphically. This is just a summary of one of them. We have all the taxa, I'll try and go into that 50 some taxa of woody plants. But you can see overall what the trend is. Um, you know, you start from totally indigenous in, in the layer right when people arrive and you then begin to get various Polynesian introductions reflected in the charcoal. It goes along pretty, you know, much the same until the end and then you can see the islands really being the vegetation is being transformed into a very heavily managed, mostly Polynesian introduced tree crops, things like breadfruit, coconut, candlenut, um, which dominate today. We also, and this is recent work, uh, at the time we did the excavations, we didn't try to do anything on this, but I retained the sediment samples. And so recently I sent a sequence through the site to Mark Horrocks in New Zealand, who's doing, uh, some of you know, a lot of phytolith pollen and starch um, analyses. So he ran a sequence for us. And we do have some interesting uh, <clears throat> results from that that add to the macro plant remains. Again, coconut, pandanus, ba banana, for example, uh, reflected, and, um, and phytolith as well. And so here's the, the pollen diagram. Too small to really read, but <clears throat> again, it'll be in the monograph. So this set of samples going bottom uh, up through the site. And what's interesting, for example, is you know coconut um, reflected throughout, and big increases in the pandanus, the screw pine, which is something that's fire resistant and, and in <clears throat> historic times dominated uh, the vegetation on the island. The phytolists, uh, not so interesting. They, of course, most of them cannot be identified to specific taxa in this case, and I don't see a lot of change there except a bit of increase in the palms, which also reflects the, the pollen coconut. So that was not terribly enlightening, but we did it. And then material culture. Um, the site was very rich in, in artifacts, numerous kinds. In the early two occupation phases, they were doing a lot of lithic production. Uh, Jenny Kahn will have a chapter in the monograph on the whole a lithic analysis reduction sequence. So you can see here preforms of, uh, most of this was ads, production of, of adses. Uh, so here are various preforms. <clears throat> and then, of course, a series as well of finished, come on, come on, come on. It's being very recalcitrant. Oh, you know, it jumped over one. Hour. There we go. So really beautiful uh, finished adzes as well as, as preforms. Um, you know, for anybody who likes artifacts, this site was, it was wonderful. I mean, we're just, every day we're coming up with goodies. Um, these are early ones. Here's some other uh, forms, um, <clears throat> just to show you pretty pictures. 
and here's some more. And you can see a lot of variation, obviously, in the typology there. And if you then look at that in terms of the sequence, there are, in fact, some substantial changes from the early ads kit to the later. Um, in particular, the development of what we call the tang, which is the butt end of the ads, uh, becomes very developed in these later ads, as you can see in the central ones up there. And they're largely untanged or minimal tangs in the early uh, ads. And this is something that was noted by early archaeologists doing typology, but they didn't know really how it fit into the sequence. And now we can kind of show how that developed and, and what the timing of that was. So this uh, chart shows you these types. The types were developed by Roger Duff back in the 1950s. This is nothing, nothing new. Um, but getting them in an actual sequence, I'm sorry, my Excel wanted to do time this way, so it's reversed from the other charts. I couldn't get it to cooperate with me to get it the other way. I gave up. I was just doing this the other day. But you can see how um, you know, there's, there's some interesting changes, mostly the type 3 being late and these type 1 and 2 being, being early. Those are the untanged uh, forms. Now, one of the things we've done recently as well is to, collaborating with Marshall Weisler, do a lot of geochemical uh, sourcing on ads material. We, with Marshall back in the early 90s for his PhD dissertation at Berkeley, we did some of this, but the techniques were pretty crude back then. Simple XRF, you know, um, <clears throat> major elements. Recently, uh, Marshall now has access to much more fine-grained uh, ICP, MS, or whatever it's called, and uh, you know, inductively coupled plasma, whatever, um, and uh, isotopes. So with those in combination, we can discriminate now uh, sources, because it's all basalt. And you know, previously, we couldn't discriminate some of the f fine differences in islands or quarries. Now we can. So we just published this, some of you may have seen, um, just a couple of months ago in PNAS. Uh, and the <clears throat> summary will be in the monograph. But you can see the main sources there. So we have two sources on Mangaya. And a lot of what they were working was of the local material, not surprisingly. But we also have ads, ads is either as finished or as material coming in from Marutu and the Austral Islands, from two sources in Samoa, and from the Marquesas Islands. So, and this is in the early phase in particular. So there was a lot of interaction, voyaging going on uh, in East Polynesia in that early time period. Again, this summarizes here time going backwards in this case. Uh, as you see, <clears throat> you know, the majority of material always local here in Mangaya, but a substantial amount of imported material early on. Uh, and even later, there's some importing, but it tends to come from more local or more closer sources of Rarotonga, the closest island to Mangaya. And there are various other kinds of artifacts, just to show you what they look like. Again, very rich um, abrading tools. We're, well, I'm right now involved in, with the branch coral abraders with Warren Sharp over at Berkeley Geochrom, we have an NSF grant. We're running uranium thorium high precision dates on those. So we're going to have another dating sequence through the site. Uh, we'll see how that compares to the radiocarbon. Uh, fishing gear, fish hooks, there were over 300. And this is just a selection of the pearl shell hooks. Um, Polynesian archaeologists get very excited. We get all a quiver, Kent, when we see, we see fish hooks. Um, those are fish hooks in pearl shell. These are in turbo shell. So that, that, that shell I told you that was reduced in size. And interestingly, the turbo, you see in this chart, uh, dominates later here in the site and the pearl shell early. Now, there's no locally occurring pearl shell on Mangaya. Um, marine surveys have never turned it up today. And you need a lagoon, basically, with depth to have pearl shell. So, the pearl shell early, uh, along with the ads, is must be imported. They're probably bringing it from other uh, Cook Islands, like Aitutaki, the big lagoons have lots of pearl shell. So when the pearl shell largely drops out here above zone six, there's a little bit late. Um, this may be a reflection of the island kind of closing in on itself, cutting off its external exchange relations, um, which relates to some of the oral traditions also on the island. And the fish hooks also show some interesting um, typological changes. We'll get into that today. Uh, there are a few other kinds of artifacts. Polynesians were noted for tattooing, and we had quite a selection of tattooing combs. Needles, if you want to call them, for I call them combs, they're comb-like. These were hafted onto a shaft and used to tattoo. Um, for these are from the early part of the site. Um, ornaments like this one in Kona shell, which a uh, version like this was reported by Sir Peter Buck uh, from Ethnographic, uh, chiefly ornaments in the Austral Islands. 
uh, various other kinds of beads, bone beads, and <coughs> porpoise, drilled porpoise tooth, and, and other kinds of um, lithic artifacts, such as these, I call them either borers or, or awls. And this one over here is almost certainly the head of a coconut grater. These were lashed to wooden stools and then used to rasp the coconut meat. I'm still processed like that in Polynesia. And then various other kinds of just retouched lithics. Um, and of course, your work bone and shell and fish hook tabs. And that beautifully worked ground piece of coral, which as soon as we dug it up, my worker said, ah, tupe which is a game they still occasionally play. It's uh, discs that are pitched. You have uh, two teams opposite, yeah, with a court between them. So I can't explain the rules to you, but anyway. Okay, um, I think about 10 more minutes here. Yeah, I get this done. So that's a review of the data of this site. You can see it's data rich. I mean, a lot of stuff. One of the reasons it's taken me so long, 30, almost 30 years to work up. But to interpret the site, we need to broaden out just a little bit uh, other parts of the island because to get the fuller picture for what happened on Mangaya. Now, as I say, the rock shelter, the, the initial occupation is the early 1200s, but that is clearly not when people first got to the island because our rat dates uh, at the interface down there, they go back to around 1100 or so. And indeed, this is probably the foundation settlement site on the island, a place called Vairorongo, which was excavated by a Japanese team the same time we were on the island, on the coast, opposite the best pass through the narrow reef where you get in with your canoe, located next to a beautiful spring of good fresh water, and next to the most important temple site on the island, the most sacred temple site, which is a later development, but often these temples are associated with founding ancestral places. So, uh, Vairorongo, and, uh, <coughs> um, they, the Japanese team, you know, got a series of radiocarbon dates. I can't make this up. This is 1200 here. So it's just slightly earlier than our basal dates, but it's sort of overlapping. And so I think the two, our sequence combined with theirs, really tie down initial Polynesian arrival, probably sometime not long after 80,000, but certainly, you know, certainly before 1200, certainly those, those two centuries. Let's put it at 1100 if you want. Okay, so that's important. Now we did work on a number of other sites. Uh, Pia Anderson and Julie Endicott, both in charge of excavations, additional rock shelters. Um, these help to fill out the sequence, particularly in the later time phases. So just mention that we're not depending just on the one site for our sequence. And we also worked on, if you'll cooperate, computer. Come on. Come on. OK. Uh, some open sites. Because in the late uh, period, certainly, that's where everybody was living out around. As I mentioned, these taro swamps are on the irrigated fields. That's where the temples were and so on. So we did some excavation. We, there was a terrace complex not too far from our rock shoulders back by the cliffs. And we <coughs> worked on a series of these sites. They, of course, the problem with these sites is they're, they're open. They're, they're very acidic clay soils. Preservation sucks. And so you know, we don't get the faunal material. We don't uh, very limited artifact range. You, you do get charcoal. Um, but it's usually very finely dispersed. Anyway, difficult to work on. So I gave it to my graduate student, Julie Endicott. <laughs> and she, she went back, of course, and you know, I did a great thesis, you know. Um, went back a couple of years later, or a couple of seasons, and her dissertation here at Berkeley is based on these later sites. So we actually know quite a lot about these late habitation sites, thanks to, to Julie's uh, work. Of course, she also found her husband there. That's another story. <clears throat> um, and then this site, which we initially tested in 91, that shows the two test bits there, another big rock shelter in Kea. And I thought, when I first saw it, oh boy, this is going to be another one like Tangatata, another great site, you know, stratigraphy and artifacts. And all. When we tested it, the occupation deposit was fairly shallow, and the only thing we got basically was human bone. And then bird bone under it in the pre occupation, once again, the palimpsest sort of thing. So Stedman liked the bird bone. So he went back, uh, I think it was in 93 or 94, with Susan Anton, some of you will remember from here. Uh, and so they expanded the excavation. I don't have this slide here, but they expanded basically in this area. And they did about 12 square meters. And we, uh, this is published. We published all this stuff in antiquity a number of years ago. But 
This site is full of nothing but human bone and earth ovens, intercutting earth ovens. And the human bone, I didn't want to show pictures today. Some people get upset seeing pictures of human bone. But if you look at it, it's all highly fractured, burned, gnawed, etc. It looks just like the pig and the dog and the middens, OK? Uh, I didn't say there 41, I think 41 MNI uh, of humans. And essentially nothing else. It's a highly specialized site. So they were making earth ovens. They were certainly processing and cooking these bodies uh, in these ovens. Now, you tell me whether it's cannibalism or not. I know people don't like to use the C word sometimes. <laughs> but uh, Mangayan oral traditions are full of references to cannibalism. They say so ethnographically, ethnohistorically, there's, there's tons of this. There are all kinds of traditions of warfare between the tribes. There's two traditions of cooking people in earth ovens. Uh, so I think, in my view, we have an archaeological signature that relates quite clearly to, and I, I don't think this has to do with you know, a la Marvin Harris trying to get protein. I think it has to do with intensive warfare and sort of the capturing of mana and the denigration of enemies and that kind of thing. But it's interesting the time period of this. Um, as you see, early 15th century, early 1400s, we've got AMS dates on the bone. It's all pretty discreet. It's not a long sequence of doing this. It's a period when there was, you know, some intense conflict and at least 40 individuals taken and, and cooked and eaten. And not just one time, because they're intercutting earth ovens. So there's, there's multiple events going on. And I'll, hopefully, I'll get back to this in a second, what I think that means. Um, and then for the very late period, and again, the, the ethnography is very rich and detailed about war, about conflict. These tribes, these six valleys, you know, they weren't unified into one political. They were, they were always fighting over control of the irrigation works. And this site that we worked on is fascinating, <clears throat> the Tautua Refuge Cave. So up in the limestone Makatea is this big cavern. It's like a mini Carlsberg bag, whatever it's called, uh, you know, caverns. Uh, you can see all the stalactites and stalagmites, the limestone. But in it, you see the platforms here, house platform, another platform here. There's like a little mini village in there, including a, a court for this toupee game pitching, according to our informant. And that's what it looks like. And ovens, and there's a water source in the back. And this is described as the refuge cave into which the Tongaiti tribe would you know, retreat when the wars were going on. And uh, they, they you know, related the informant who uh, he's a member of that tribe and took us in there, you know, describes this as his like great grandfather and great great grandfather doing this. And we took radiocarbon samples from some of the charcoal and the ovens exposed on the floor, and indeed they came out basically just immediately pre contact European. So uh, that, that certainly fits. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on this. We did also, as I mentioned, core the taro swamps. We got a pollen sequence out of this that clearly shows um, major modifications to the interior volcanic cone of the island, just briefly the pollen diagram with uh, forest taxa here that go back about 7,000 years, suddenly cutting out, and just these uh, pandanus and scrub and ferns and big monster charcoal after human arrival. So that's another part of the story is, is major modification of the environment in terms of changing the vegetation on that cone. So what you end up with um, is this kind of a landscape where the valley bottom has been intensively modified for pond field irrigation, right? And the higher volcanic slopes are just denuded, degraded. You can't hardly grow anything up there. Uh, they're 20 million years old. They're laterized, they're nutrient poor. So everything was focused on these irrigation systems. And, and that's what the ethnohistory also indicates, this intense competition over these uh, Puna lands. Um, <clears throat> so I tried to summarize that in, in this diagram, just showing how what it looked like originally, people coming in and probably attempting to garden on those hill slopes originally, doing shifting cultivation. They stripped the vegetation. And then, of course, they didn't realize how old this island was, and they wasn't going to recoup and re, you know, revegetate. And so the whole thing shifted to, to irrigation. Um, and so you end up, as I published some of this before, also with this very interesting, so I call it the, the mythopraxis of Mangaya, where the war leader, so they, they had a succession of 40-some chiefs called Te Mangaya in their oral traditions, uh, each one succeeding not by hereditary succession of a chiefship as is typical in Polynesian, but rather by conquest and war, right? Mm -hmm. And driving off the vanquished people onto the Makatea where they had to eke out gardens, you know, sweet potato. And with taro being, you know, the most important crop, the most important god being Rongo, who's an agricultural god, but also the god of war, a, a two-faced sort of Janus-like god here, and to whom human 
sacrifices were offered at times of war and in times of peace, daily offerings of irrigated cooked taro. So it's a really interesting system that, that evolved. Um, and to try and interpret all this in the last two minutes, uh, in this monograph, I'm drawing on some theoretical work that came out, not of this, but of the Hawaii Biocomplexity Project a few years ago, uh, modeling that we did with uh, Shripad Tuljapurkar and his postdocs down at Stanford. And if anybody's interested in this, I can give you the references published in a series of articles in, in a Journal of Theoretical Population Biology. But basically, um, th their <coughs> models, when you run simulations on uh, food availability and link to population growth on these kind of circumscribed environments. Regardless of how big uh, population you start with or the land area, you end up with curves that are very similar in their shape and in the timing, which is really important. And so you get population growth. And you, they sort of resemble your logistic curve, but they're not a logistic curve, okay? They're truly exponential initially. And then all of a sudden the crunch comes faster than you think it's gonna come at you. As Cedric Pielsen says, like a freight train coming at you. And the flip side of that is food availability. And so as your population crunch is coming, what happens here? You, you're in a state of hunger, okay? Uh, and I should, you know, I could give a whole talk about just this sort of model. But when I try to interpret the Mangaian sequence, of this, I think something like that is what happened to Mangaia. People arriving say around 1100 AD it takes about 300 years to get to the crunch. Well, when would that put us at? 1400, the early 1400s. What happens when we look at the pig production record? Huge decline, right? Pigs are a means of surplus. Production is high, food available, you can afford to have them. The 1400s, pig production goes down to almost nothing. When is the timing of that site with the cannibalism, right? Early 1400s. So I think what happened is Mangaya got into a state of considerable stress about three to 400 years after its initial occupation. But they didn't stay in that state. Interestingly, I think there was a restructuring of society. Uh, restructuring involved several things. One, expansion of the irrigation works, probably. Um, those more sustainable fisheries, uh, fresh water and so on. Probably social and political restructuring. They didn't ever get rid of war completely, but it's quite clear they didn't continue cannibalism rampantly through, through the whole sequence, right? So I think there was a restructuring uh, and it's interesting that the pig production does build up again at a certain point, never as much. And, and maybe I'm reading too much into the pig, but we grasp at what straws we can, you know, in archaeology. Um, and then it may be, you know, then again, getting toward European contact, more stresses were increasing again. So it's not a simple progression. It's a more complicated story, I think, of, you know, uh, some, some early hard times, restructuring. And there's an interesting, an ethnographer, Michael Riley at the University of Auckland, who's worked extensive Mangaian oral traditions. And, and he teases out a sequence, something like this, interestingly, out of the traditions. He thinks that, uh, you know, there are these references to a, a deeper time period in their traditions when there was warfare and cannibalism, but then some kind of restructuring and so on. So the, it's the two sources of knowledge about this island are not, um, you know, opposed necessarily. So we, I ended up producing this sequence and, you know, I'm, a, I'm at heart still a culture historian, so we gotta have a nice sequence. Um, but I've told you the story already. Anyway, and just to end, just a few scenes, uh, some field work mapping that. Oh, yeah, you know, he's, you know, he was young once and had a dark beard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well that's very, you know, that's kind of like in the Cook Islands, they all do this colonial sort of, you know, the knee socks, very, uh, it's very hip. Um, and then I was even doing outreach early on. So there's, we had the local high school there, like, lecturing to them about archeology span and so on. And then here, just again, um, yeah, who is that guy on the right? I don't know. Uh, that's a um, long time ago, Kent. Uh, Joanna Ellison, the palynologist, Dave Stedman, so, and Julie Endicott, uh, we were all arriving there. And then this scene, this was the, Morning of departure, we've been partying for about three days. <laughs> Polynesians love to have big parties when you know, it's the end of the time you gotta go. So we made a big earth oven feast thing. And here we were heading to the airport, so our box is there, but here's Pia Anderson, um, and there's Julie hiding yeah. behind there, and all of our friends. Uh, Mangaya, and of course, lots and lots of people to thank. So I think I pulled it in right about on time. <laughs> I know some of you. Yeah, again, traditional. Um, if you have to leave, go ahead and leave. I am certainly going to have to leave, but um, it's fun to talk to you about this later. And I know the cat is already said he'd be willing to take some questions. Yeah, I'm so glad that in terms of the model you've got, population places, human population places, it's a pretty critical role. And um, talking about the three to four hundred years.
through here. So one of the questions I had is, and we obviously have some regional trade going on. So are there multiple migrations of people coming along to the island, or is it all indigenous population growth, or is it some kind of mix going on? Yeah, that's really hard to, to tease out. Uh, what we do know increasingly from recent work, there are, this is Eastern Polynesia. Right? Mm -hmm. So Western Polynesia, Samoa and Tonga were settled by 800 BC. But then it, it's increasingly clear that people didn't expand to Eastern Polynesia, so around 1800. Mm -hmm. Then it looks like we've got this big expansion. And you know, every island gets hit, boom, 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 because the chronologies are really coming clearly on this island. Tahiti, in one case, all the way to Easter Island. Yeah. So there were a lot of people. In order to fuel that rapidly, there had to be more. It wasn't one of the But there was certainly uh, you know, some diaspora going on out yeah. of West Polynesia. Yeah. Yeah. But once each island was settled, you know, I don't know, there were clearly you know, trading, there was interaction. These were the related families, probably. Yeah. Uh, at some point, they, you know, after a few hundred years, they clearly are going, oh, you know, they're putting on the yeah. um, you know, brakes and they're cutting off exchange. And the island has a reputation. Historically, historically, of being very close to defensive and mm -hmm. warlike, and not, you know, when they play rugby uh, in the Cook Islands, everybody fears the Mangaians. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, the joke is that the, the Mangaian rugby players practice on the Makatea, which is this pinnacle of cars. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a joke, but I mean, they're that tough. You know. yeah. I mean, it's an interesting question to answer. It's a bad part to it. Just curious. About it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, so uh, thanks for asking that because you know you might say, well maybe that's some kind of a cremation site or something, you know. But there actually are lots of burials, and the burial practices are well well known. And they're primarily in the caves, tons of these caves in the Makatea. And that's where they would dispose of bodies to and not burn them and not cut them up or whatever. So yeah, they're there. <clears throat> and uh, Anton and Seven have actually published a bit on, on some of the caves with burials in them. Uh, did, I guess I think they are so uh, fractured, uh, you know, beat up, it'd be almost impossible to tell. Um, the stuff is, is, you know, fragmentary. And the long, the long bones are invariably, and we have some, by the way, in this site, in the Mountain 44 site as well, there's a limited amount of human material, and it's the same. So the long bones are all completely fractured open, seemingly for marrow extraction. Uh, they all show, not all, but like 97 percent show burning. Signing, you know. So there's a detailed report that will be published on this. Yeah, so I mean, they are treating them the, the way that you would cook a you know, deal with pigs, exactly the same, same way. Yeah, this so you only mentioned these earth ovens in this one special site, but what about the other sites that people have excavated you in? Oh, no, I think our are earth ovens? Yeah, yeah, I think I mentioned around about 50 some features, of which most of them are ovens okay. in, in our habitation okay. site. Ovens are harsh. It's hard to tell you know, one grades to the other, yeah, the size of them. The deep ones with the stones are clearly. Because you just so clearly said earth ovens look to those human bones. Yeah, well, that, that side, they're, yeah, they're very clear. There's about six or seven of these so ovens. They were just for paper. Just for so paper. Oh, and you know what I didn't comment on, though? I can find it. Um, let me see if I can come back. So that site with the, you know, all the processed humans, let's see if I can find it. Uh, the only artifacts in it are items of personal adornment. Where are they? Here. Um, going up. Well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Right? I mean, so like the, the, the main occupation, well, actually, there's fish, there's fish, there's fish, there's fish, there's fish. This site has four artifacts, and they're all personal adornment. There are beads, yeah, three beads, and one is a fish appointment, it's of a two piece kind that is also worn as an ornament. So I think those were ornaments on people who were processed there. Uh, you, you, can I follow up on um, Heather's work? Yeah. You, you talked about the wood collection and, and watching the wood change. Yeah. And then you moved on to Phyllis, I think. Did he find no macro remains? Because you listed those sweet potatoes and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. 
Yeah. On your list of to tax it. So what, what, what's the question? The question is, did he identify macro yeah. remains yes. of planetary? Yeah, the, the list that I showed initially, that was all based on macro okay. remains. Um, yeah, which included a variety of things. In some cases, it was, uh, I think, the skin peelings of some of the tubers, leaf material for the now, um, you know, death of the sugar cane. So his, his work was all basically macro, including then, charcoal. Oh, yeah, and then the final list coming in later. Right. He didn't deal at all with, with micro that stuff. That, that has been done recently by Mark Horrocks in New Zealand on sediment samples that I retained. Oh, 